So on your screen, I love how it doesn't show you the options. It says to rank from greater to lesser these advancements in aerospace engineering. So this is your opinion on what you think is the greatest and the least of these advancements and achievements. Um, we're doing it a little differently this hour than we did last hour. I am not showing you the results. Um, unfortunately, I didn't record the results before I cleared them from last hour. Um, but I do remember what they were. Talk amongst your table, but you are answering this as you see. But if you talk amongst each other, you can make a case for why you think any one of the five is, is better. Um, as of now, we have two people responding. Um, and it will be interesting to see how it pans out. And I'll show you the results in a little bit. Um, obviously, I have my view. Um, and when we get through it, we'll talk about it a little bit. Again, if while you're doing this, if you want to step out and get some water or coffee or beat your head on the wall, you're welcome to do that. So just as a point, on this one, there is no right answer. They're all wrong. Um, no, I'm just kidding. It is, it is your view, um, and you are allowed to hold your own view. The next one we do in this, there is a right answer, um, but this one doesn't have a right answer. Some of you answered twice. I might allow it. I can't remember if I said that or not. Anybody still ordering? Are you all done?
Okay, folks. So, obviously, if you haven't replied, you're welcome to. But let's just show the results. So you all, so far, and there's 66 of you, have ranked it number one, internal combustion engine, two computers, three Kaylee's glider, four, the gas turbine rocket, and five, the helicopter. Okay, I will tell you the helicopter's in the same place as last hour, but several of the other ones have moved about. So you all put the internal combustion engine first. Do you think the last hour put the internal combustion engine first? No? Okay. What do you, what, anybody want to hazard a guess what they put number one? At least glider, computers, any other? Any other guesses? Yeah? Helicopters. Helicopters, computers. Come on, we got to go through at least every other option. Gas turbine rocket. Okay, so they did not put internal combustion engine first. That one was second, by the way. Third was Kaylee's glider. Fourth was computers. Fifth was helicopter. And second was, uh, first was gas turbines and rockets. Now, the difference between this hour and last hour, obviously we have a different population sample. May or may not be representative. But the biggest one is last hour I allowed them to see the answers. And I did not allow you to see the answers. So we can, I'm not making any claims, but you may or may not have been influenced, or they may or may not have been influenced by the people that answered first. Versus now, you couldn't do that. OK. Do you have a question? OK. Just one. So we'll talk about them in no particular, well, actually, a very particular order. We're going to start with Kaylee's glider. And both groups ranked at number three. And I feel. That's giving the short shrift to George. Because switch over. What is it about Kaylee's glider that's so important? Yeah, actually, in a sense, it was the first design as drawn, and then he built models that was visualized and then actualized of what we would call the common modern fixed wing aircraft configuration. So you have the fuselage that kind of holds everything together. In our case, it carries things like cargo and self-loading cargo, which is the euphemism for passengers. Um, you have our lifting surface, our wing, and then we have this tail, the empennage, the control surfaces at the back. So it separates and actually understanding for the first time the need for both lift and control. Now we're missing something with the glider, something that we need for sustained flight. What's that? Propulsion. And as you notice, two of our options were propulsion systems. And you put internal combustion engine first. Now, we have actually both of those that were up there are internal combustion engines. A gas turbine engine, a rocket engine is an internal combustion engine. What is it about internal combustion engines that were a big game changer for propulsion and aviation? Yes. Living. Yeah, but we we weren't using humans. In most cases, what were people trying to propel their aircraft with? What, what was the source of power? What were they using? Steam engines. Now, a steam engine is an external combustion engine. And when we think of internal combustion engines, what do we think of? What type of engines? Huh? Yeah, reciprocating piston engines. Now, they don't have to be reciprocating piston engines. You can have a non-reciprocating piston engine, like a Wankel that rotates. Or you can have a gas turbine or a ramjet. Those are internal combustion engines. What an internal combustion engine is, compared to an external combustion engine, is in an internal combustion engine, you're combusting fluid. That mixture of air and fuel or oxidizer and fuel 
is your working fluid. You extract your energy directly from that fluid. An external combustion like a steam engine, you burn, say, coal and air, and then you use that to, say, heat up another fluid that you then use to extract energy. And at the time, we used external combustion engines. In fact, the greatest mode of transport at the time, or two greatest modes of transport, used them. Locomotives and steamships, railway locomotives, right? But unless you have obscene working pressures in a steam engine, you just cannot get the power density that you can out of an internal combustion engine. In fact, I will say this, at the time the Wright brothers built theirs, no one could get the energy power density out of any internal combustion engine. The Wright brothers had to build their own engine. And it was really good for spewing fuel all over the pilot because they cut so many corners to make it light enough to fit on their aircraft. They just kind of leaked. In fact, it was pretty common for aircraft engines to leak fuel and oil for a long time. Um, when we talk about artifacts of import, we'll talk about the USB-29. Uh, because it is a very important aircraft in a lot of respects. But it was also kind of a dead end um, at the time. And we'll get to that here in a second, what, what replaced it. But um, more B-29s were lost to engine fires than were lost to enemy action. Either artillery from the ground or fighter aircraft. And that was because the USB-29 had a problem. It was limited, not in range, not by fuel consumption, but by oil consumption. And it had a, this tremendous tendency to spew oil out of the engine, because it was that, and onto very, very hot bits of metal that then would catch fire and then burn the wing off, and the wing would fall off and crash. So, you know, we've had that problem in aviation. So, we talked about that, internal combustion engines you put highly. And so those two things, Cayley's glider and the internal combustion engine, gave us aviation. Now, you put far further down on the list gas turbines and rockets, which is fine. Nothing wrong with that. But we'll go back in time. To this. Now, what is this? Anybody remember what this is from watching? Yeah. Hero's engine. Hero's engine is that kind of first visualization of a jet engine or a rocket. Now, anybody know all of our, our jet engines and many of our rockets are also internal combustion. What's the difference between a jet and our piston prop. Yes. Yep. Fundamentally, what's the difference? Okay, so let's rephrase that. Turboshaft engines on a, on, a, on a helicopter, they're gas turbine engines. What's the difference between that and a turbojet that we say used to use on fixed wing aircraft? What does a piston prop or turboshaft do? What does the engine do? What's its primary purpose? To turn a shaft, which turns a propeller or a rotor, right? We don't do that with, say, a ramjet. Purest form of jet, ramjet. Sucks air at the front, spits air out the back, no moving parts. Just literally a fuel injector nozzle and an igniter. Beautiful. What we've done, moving from our piston prop internal combustion engine to our jet engine, is instead of using our working fluid to turn a shaft, yes, in the case of a turbojet that does for the compressor, 
We're now using that working fluid to propel us directly. And that changes the game again. Big leap. What does now using our working fluid as a propelling fluid do for our engine? What's the first thing it does? Yeah. Increases weight? Decreases weight. Yeah. It de well, it decreases weight because we don't have all those accoutrements. But the big thing is, for the same amount of power, in terms of power that goes to thrust, to move us along, our engine gets a lot lighter. Because now, instead of extracting power from that flu fluid and then putting it back into thrust, we're taking that directly. Yes, it's less efficient because we're accelerating it a lot faster. But our power density goes up a lot. In fact, it changes the fundamental behavior of our aircraft. And we'll talk about that later on this semester, but really next year in aircraft performance and design, what happens when we move from a power-limited to a thrust-limited system? It completely changes how we operate our aircraft and what we can do with it. So before, with a power piston prop, it doesn't matter how high up you fly, you, can, you basically fly the same distance. There's a relationship. It's not perfect. This is the ideal sense. With a jet, the higher you fly, the further you can go. Not only can you get there faster, but you can go farther. Completely different behaviors. But it allows us to fly much, much faster, much, much higher. But it also does another thing. What is it about moving from our working fluid and our propell propelling fluid being separate to being the same that is a big change for us, specifically in space? Yeah. Well, we have our oxygen, oxidizer, but imagine using a turbo pump type thing to drive a propeller. Really inefficient. Yeah, we don't need the atmosphere. We are carrying our own working fluid, our own propelling fluid. Now, if we have an electric rocket, we're doing the same thing. It's just no longer a combustion engine. We're using electricity to do that, accelerating. But we're carrying our own propelling fluid. Using our working fluid as a propelling fluid changes that game. It enables space flight, where we don't have enough meaningful atmosphere without doing a hell of a lot of work to give us that thrust. So while each of those you can't get to jet engines, historically, that there just wasn't a path without going through internal combustion engines, they're important. OK, number three, both of you put computers. Now, you didn't hear about computers if you watched the videos. This is the odd one out. Why is it that you think computers are important? And I agree, they're really important. Yeah. Well, they, they shrink stuff down, but really they just don't display half the stuff they displayed before because you don't need it. Yeah, so, I mean, obviously they did that. But what's, I mean, what's some of the big things we've got? And, he, and, and FADEC is a big one. What did FADEC enable us to do? So instead of manually controlling the fuel flow rate and maybe, in some cases, some of the early jet engines had valves that you controlled manually. They usually were done mechanically later. We're now doing this all electronically. So it allows us to get much, much more efficient engines. Same reason your automobile engine is much, much more efficient than it was 25 years ago. For the same displacement and power, you burn a lot less fuel. It also radically improved reliability. Where before a jet engine, you might get 2,500 hours between overhaul, which is a lot. You now can leave an engine on the wing for maybe 50,000 hours. Think about that. An average, typical commercial transport will fly 3,000 hours in a year, roughly. You're talking more than 15 years without having to take that engine off. Flying 3,000 hours a year, that's well over 12 hours a day, just operating constantly for that amount of time. 
It's done the same thing, by the way, to piston engines, where before 1,000 hours between overhaul was good for a general aviation piston engine. Now that they've gone to full authority digital engine control, you can get 2,500, 3,000 hours out of those. Your car's the same way, your reliability of your car. They don't break down like they used to. You can get 20,000 miles between an oil change because it's monitoring that, because you don't have to do that yourself. Okay. And then, of course, we have all of the safety enhancements. Reduces the workload of the flight crew. Moving from three, four, five person flight crews, just back in the day of the old piston props across the Atlantic, you had a captain. You had a first officer that were flying it. You had a flight engineer, second officer, whose sole job was to make sure the engines didn't blow up literally sat there fine-tuning the mixture and the RPM so that the engine didn't disintegrate or if it started going wrong, he'd reduce the power. Or the fact that they were out of sync on one wing would cause a vibration, maybe cause the wing to rip off. All of that's now handled by a computer. And then on top of that, you had a navigator or maybe even a radio operator. Now you have two guys and the relief crew. And unless things go really wrong, only one of them needs to be doing anything. But the navigator used to use a sextant. They had periscopes so they could see the stars. Then they had great radio nav, Omega. And the whole purpose of Omega was you could set off from New York or Boston or Nova Scotia and hit Ireland. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, that was considered precision. If you could m make it and find an island on the other side of a 2,000 nautical mile cross. And now, with computers and GPS and modern satellite-based ADSB, we can find and we can pinpoint to within 10 meters, horizontally, even closer, maybe 10 meters vertically, an aircraft traveling across the Atlantic all enabled by computers. In fact, GPS doesn't work without computers. You want to try to do the math and the relativistic maths of GPS on, by hand? Mm, good luck to you. And they've also done things like envelope protection and install warning and all of that. And then on the military side, not on the commercial side, they've enabled us to build aircraft and fly aircraft we couldn't have otherwise. And even on the civil side. In fact, some of you may own an aircraft that's basically impossible to fly without computers. Anybody know what those are? Yeah? But, I mean, who here owns a multi-rotor drone? Anybody? Like a DJI, yeah. Have you ever tried to fly that, four throttles, six throttles with your hands, doing it all yourself? Almost no one here, and probably no one in this room, but almost no one can do that. They require computers. Things like the F-16, that actually, believe it or not, longitudinally statically stable. Doesn't need a computer to fly. It's computer controlled because they were building another aircraft at the time. So computers, massive improvement. Okay, the last one, number five, the one all of you put at the bottom, not maybe not all of you individually, the helicopter. Anybody want to say something nice about helicopter? Yes. There's a lot of maths, okay? That's not usually, unless you're a mathematician, not usually how you hype something up. Yes. Okay, think about the modern world and what it would be like if we didn't have that. How do we get stuff onto the top of a super tall building? Like an air conditioning unit. Yeah. Giant cranes, or on the top of a mountain. We do that with helicopters. So, they are pretty substantial. They have changed the way things work. If you're in a dinghy at sea, before then, you just hope a ship got to you. It might take a few days. 
Now, they send out helicopters. You're reasonably close to land, or they can send a boat and send a helicopter, pick you up out of the ocean. That's changed. Yeah, helicopters, they became practical during the Second World War, and they weren't really practical. I mean, worked with a guy at one time. His father was an early helicopter pilot for the US Army, and they were doing search and rescue training. Hot temperature, high temperature search and rescue training. They went out, lowered the basket down the, the cable, Airman that was being rescued climbed on board, and they started winching it up. And the airman stayed on the ground, and the helicopter slowly came down. So we've changed a lot thanks to gas turbine engines and the like. But it isn't. I wouldn't ever rank it above fifth in all of those, but it is actually a big deal. Okay, before we move on, has anybody asked any questions? None of you have. You have no questions. Oh, that's unfortunate. Okay. So we'll close that poll, and we will do the next one. Where is this? What is this? Sorry. Um, there are technically two right answers but only one of which is the one I'm looking for. It's the more right, more correct. Um, you can see what the less correct of the correct answers is by looking down here in the bottom right. It is a US Air Force, well, there is a US Air Force Base golf course in here. Um, told the last, Last group, um, the, the joke about why are U.S. Air Force Base golf courses always nicer than U.S. Army Base golf courses? And that's because when the U.S. Army gets the money to build a new base, they build the base, and they use what's left over to build the golf course and inevitably run out of money. When the U.S. Air Force builds, gets the money to build a base, they build a golf course, and they run out of money building the golf course. So they have a really nice golf course, and they go back to Congress and say, we can't finish our runway, can you give us more money? And Congress always does. And then that leads into the fact that um, it turns out if you want to fly aircraft in the U.S. military, you actually, best place to do it is the Army. They have 10 times more aircraft than the U.S. Air Force does. Um, mainly helicopters, uh, but yeah. So 54 of you have answered so far. Yep, yeah, and there goes Edgy Rome for my phone. <laughs> and I have no wife, uh, no mobile phone reception. 60. So this is an interesting thing. So they, this building, side commentary, uh, it looks like it completely died. Uh, side commentary. Uh, this building is predicated on there being ubiquitous wireless access. Um, Ubiquitous wireless access to, to everything, and it's not reliable. <laughs> Oops. I'm giving away the answer, am I not? Okay, well, we'll, we'll release the proper answer in a second. 65, okay. 86% so of you, the first aerodrome slash airport, 11% the site of the first rocket launch, 2% uh, put a random farmer's field. It is not that. That is definitely incorrect. And, oh, 1% <laughs> of you put a home of U.S. Air Force golf course, which, as I said, is technically correct, but not the answer I'm looking for. Um, you would get credit if I did that on a exam, because it is technically correct. Um, it is, let's see if this works, because of the... Uh, 
Uh, no, it doesn't. All right, there we go. As you say, it is the home of the first aerodrome, airport, flight school, and like. Anybody remember what this place is called? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's not where they built their bikes, believe it or not. Where they built their planes. Um, they, their, their, their workshop where they built their bikes was located further in, in closer to Dayton, Ohio. It is basically in rural, well, semi-rural Ohio. It is right at the end of an active runway of a U.S. Air Force base, so it is a bit hard to access, but you can. It is, there's a museum, a national monument. You can go there, and you can book your tour and go out and see the little hangar and stuff that's there. It's a replica of what was there. Unfortunately, like everything else, it's, it's not the same. Okay. Have anybody asked any questions? Of course, I have no idea because I have no, nope, no, qu none of you have any questions. I don't remember where Goddard flew his first rocket offhand. Sorry. <laughs> well, actually, the first rocket launch was China, but yes, Goddard uh, liquid rocket was, I don't remember where he flew it. Yeah, the Chinese were, were great at building lots of those. Okay. Um, since you have no questions right now, the next activity um, is a survey. And this is just, we're trying this out for you guys. And we didn't get to it last hour because there were lots of questions. So I do encourage you to watch the video and see what questions were asked and answered. Um, but talk amongst your table and then fill out. I did it again. Um, the survey. Please fill in the survey. And these are word clouds. And what words would you associate? There's three questions with lighter than air flight, fixed wing flight, and space flight. And I'm just curious as to what you're going to put. Um, and, and anybody can fill it out. You don't all have to type it in. One person each table if you want. Uh, 25 characters or less for each answer. Um, and this is just to see what you've taken away from the history part. I said we didn't get to it last hour because they had plenty of questions. Um, we have a few questions here um, that we'll, we'll answer but, uh, in a second. Um, And, and one of them is actually very appropriate, and I'm glad it was asked. So take a few minutes to fill that out, and then we'll get to that. I will tell you I've turned on the obscenity filter. So um, if you guys want to try out and see if you can get past it, I'm not going to stop you. But um, it, I, it'll be interesting to see what it does and doesn't catch.
Folks, while we're doing this, there are a couple questions that I think people actually want answers to. Um, we'll get to what is a helicopter in a second. Um, the joke is that it's a spinny thing that's so ugly it, the earth repels it. Or um, a device that beats the air into submission. Um, but, you know, beyond that. Uh, how am I? Um, I'm okay. Uh, having, having going till 5 on Monday and then starting at 9 on Tuesday teaching is, does tire you out a little bit. Um, uh, but the big one, there are two questions that are pretty close together on this. Um, what specific content, i.e. dates, people of history can be assessed, and what are we actually getting assessed on? So I will take the second question at this point to relate to the first, because obviously you'll be assessed on, we'll talk about more of that as we go. Um, with the assessment on history, um, things like putting events in order, um, so you know roughly when things occurred relative to each other, so it will require that you pay attention. Linking up people to their artifacts, their development, what we know them for, so who Koryalev was, what he was famous for, those kind of things. The beauty, of course, is that your exams are open notes, open book, open help sheet. So having that help sheet that just kind of puts stuff in general order. I am not going to ask you specifically what year the Montgolfier brothers did their hot air balloon flight. I might ask you what year the Wright brothers' first flight was. Anybody know? Yeah? 1903, December 1903. No, I, I won't. I probably don't. I hope. I don't think I've asked you that. Um, so it is that kind of stuff. It, that's what history is about. I, the, the, basically, the setting up um, just kind of those things. Uh, the question that definitely it isn't on the midterm anymore is what is my favorite aircraft that was on the first year we ran this, um, mainly because the artifacts of import was originally scheduled to happen now. Um, Time-wise, it got pushed back to the end, and it was seeing if you were paying attention type question. Um, but we will talk about that towards the end of the semester. Okay. Um, uh, okay. Um, there is a question. Could you explain the difference between a craft carrying liquid propellant and the pro traditional method of carrying fuel into space again. Didn't quite catch that. Um, no, actually, I won't today, mainly because we're going to talk about that when we talk about rockets um, in several weeks. And we'll talk a lot more about that. And just easier to just say, if you want to, watch ahead, whatever topic number that is, propulsion, space propulsion, uh, and rockets, and space flight. Or you know, just wait and enjoy yourself and enjoy the ride. Um, because I will answer that, and if I don't answer it successfully, we'll bring it back again, okay? Um, on Blackboard, there are videos on Q&A sessions. Are they, so th basically what's gonna happen is, as each week comes along, last, I'm leaving last year's Q&A sessions up because the topics are the same until they're replaced by this year's podcasts. Um, and when they're replaced by this year's podcasts, they won't be relevant anymore. But in case something, say, goes wrong with that, they're there, okay? So that's why they're on. Um, if our gliders crashed and burned, do we get a new one? I, I would like to see how your glider caught fire. Um, if you've lost your glider, no, we don't have enough to guarantee you a new one. Please work with others. You're welcome to buy one. Those links off Amazon, they come, you know, whatnot. Um, but you can just work with others. Okay, um, let's go back to our poll. And let's see if I can show you the results. Okay. Words that you think are associated with lighter than air flight. Balloons. Um, okay. Rudimentary, slow, um, hot air balloons, buoyancy. The Montgolfier brothers, Zeppelin, Blimp, Feather, Aerostat, Buoyancy, Rudimentary. Okay. So buoyancy, obviously, that's the big thing with lighter than air flight. You've gotten the basic concept that we use the air itself, the static air, to hold us up. Um, anybody know, interesting, gas turbines in lighter than air flight. There aren't many gas turbine 
powered dirigibles, mainly because we don't need that power density. So we go with slightly more efficient propulsion systems. Um, anybody know what's the difference between a dirigible, an airship, a dirigible, and a blimp is? And a balloon. Yes. So we had balloon, dirigible, blimp, and airship. Unpropelled. I mean, obviously, hot air balloon, we can go up and down just by letting the air cool or venting. But in general, we, don't, we can't control where it goes. We can go up, go down, and maybe the wind will carry us where it wants. So that's a balloon. An airship is one that has a method of control and ideally propulsion. And as, he, as we said, a blimp is a non-rigid airship, just gas pressure. So the Goodyear blimp, it literally is just gas pressure. We hang the gondola below that. Versus rigid or semi-rigid airships, which are the dirigibles that we talked about. Okay? Um, helium, hydrogen, someone, did, was Hindenburg up there? Or did someone remove it? It was up there before. Yeah, Hindenburg. Okay. Anybody know why Hindenburg caught fire? Well, yeah, it was a, well on the airship and then the tower. They were differential. But why it actually caught fire had nothing to do with the hydrogen. Now, that's not saying the hydrogen didn't burn. You can see in the video the hydrogen burning. It's burning well above the rest of the airship. The main reason it caught fire was it was made of rocket fuel. They took cotton and doped it with aluminum. Basically a solid rocket fuel, not an oxidizer. Um, it was extremely flammable. Once that started burning, the hydrogen burned. It would have still burned had it been helium gas. This would have had burning helium gas venting. It did not explode because an explosion is what's called a detonation. That's a supersonic pressure wave. It deflagrated. It burned. It was bad. Um, interesting thing, if it had been uh, helium filled, it wouldn't have carried nearly as much stuff. Um, and the helium filled airships of the U.S. Navy of similar time, they met very poor fates. They tended to break up and crash. Um, if you ever go to NASA Ames in uh, Palo Alto, California. That's the old Moffett Naval Air Station. It was named after Admiral Moffett, who was in charge of the US Navy's airship program. And he died when the airship he was on broke up over the sea. So uh, the like. Um, they are very efficient, though not very fast, but they do have that problem. OK. Um, the next one, let's see if this works. What words? you associate with fixed wing flight? UAVs, commercial flight, Otto Lilienthal. Um, I, interesting spelling, there's nothing wrong with that. I, I do have a question, is that because the auto, um, auto subtitling has screwed up? Because it does get those things wrong all the time. Um, I, I do encourage you, so all of the videos are subtitled, and it's all been done by auto subtitling. I do encourage you to turn it on and look at the fun things that come out of it. I have corrected some, but not all. Um, Ryanair, because that's what I really think of first with <laughs> fixed wing flight. Um, but absolutely correct. Aerodyne, yes, there's a good word from the history one. I'm not going to ask you to define it. But I may ask you to find the definition. Uh, Mike Cox Long. Uh, so someone has 
figured out how to get around the thing. Uh, faster transport, uh, taken for granted, Kaylee's glider, jets, right, 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 brother gliders, planes, birds. So are birds fixed wing? They're obviously animals, so. Then, but would you consider a bird a fixed wing flying machine? And yes, we are machines in some respects. But would you consider them fixed wing? That's a good question. I, have, I am not going to offer you an answer, because um, I'm not going to ask that question on a thing. But that's one of those things. What are birds fixed wing? The wings clearly aren't fixed. They move. They flap. But so do actual aircraft wings. They flap. Not necessarily because we use them for propulsion or lift. They, they designed a FIFA, but they flat. Okay. Uh, revolutionary. Lots of things might be revolutionary. The like. Okay. Okay. Space flight. Now, there was one on here I wouldn't have thought, um, and I'm not sure I agree with. Maybe it's gone now. Oh, no, it's still there. Yeah. So, um, I should have then developed a uh, yes or no, true or false uh, poll in response to this, whether you agree with that statement or not. So one of your colleagues in here said that Rocket is Katy Perry's best song. I make no claims, yes or no. Um, but that was not one I was expecting. Bell nozzle, very good. I didn't expect that. Um, the power of minds. I don't quite get that one. Um, Challenger. Ooh, we can talk a lot about Challenger if you want. Von Braun. Okay. Um, so all of those are right. Those are good. Those are good things to have in your mind. They'll help you, obviously, advising. So I'm going to not delete these, save these, and download them for you to have. Okay, any more questions? Uh, we got our gliders crashed and burned. Hopefully they didn't burn. What would you re recommend the best mode for revision of the subject is? The best mode of revision is to keep up with it all as we go along, engage in these activities, watch talk amongst yourselves. When we get to revising for individual assessments, we'll talk about that a little bit more. With your glider activity, it literally is fill out those questions and then talk to your colleagues about it because you'll be able to answer it better than anybody else. Um, would you say it is rightfully respons who is rightfully responsible for the first flight, Kaylee or the Wright brothers? Um, you can't get one without the other. There is a chain of things. We are not here today because of any one event, right? I mean, you could also say that the guys that developed, I mean, frankly, it's that bacteria that managed to invade a cell and not kill it that gave us mitochondria. I mean, that's, you know, all life before that is much more varied. We're now on a simple track. It's only ever happened once in the history of the universe as far as we know. So basically, all of us are carrying a mutated form of this one bacterium, one individual in us. So we could say that. So um, I wouldn't say Kaylee is any more or less important in that sense. Actually, I would say in some senses, the Wright brothers probably only changed things by a couple of years at most because everybody else was coming onto the same ideas and things were advancing so quickly. Um, uh, Kaylee is probably a little bit more of an outlier in that. Um, there aren't many people that if we just removed them, things wouldn't happen. Happened. But we wouldn't necessarily be where we are exactly today. Um, I realize I haven't been submitting attendance. What do I do? I don't know. Just start. Again, I'm not using it against you. It's there to, there's two reasons we track attendance. One is to make sure you're OK. If you're not attending, we're gonna, we want to know why because you couldn't be arsed is perfectly valid in most cases, except for if you're a tier four student, in which case if you're not engaging, the government's not happy with that, um, which is the other reason. Um, hopefully, you no longer get um, polled, it may not happen today, about have you attended the asynchronous watching the video sessions? I think we've tried to turn that off. Because the fact of the matter is I can tell who's watching videos or not. 
Again, I don't care, because if you're watching a group, only one of you will have been logged on. It's only the failover if you're not doing other things and we're trying to figure out what's going on. Okay? Yes, I'd rather you come to these sessions than not, but it's not a requirement in that sense. But engaging with your program is. Um, do we need to hand in the questions on gliders? No, they're there for you to use on your quizzes. What is my favorite plane? Stay tuned to week 11 of teaching. That's S plus week 12. Do we get to keep our gliders? No, do we have to keep our gliders? You get to keep them. You don't have to. When you're done, you can ceremoniously torch them. Okay, that's not great for the environment because they're plastic and the toxic fumes, but I, you know, they're there for you. They are yours. Um, you do not have to turn. Would it, yeah, uh, duh, yeah. When will the glider quiz be up? Um, it goes live next Friday, a week Friday. Um, I, when I get back to my desk, I will, I will make sure that you can access the practice quiz. Um, the practice quiz is a range of question topics of the same type that you will see on the three in-semester assessments. You get to do it as many times as you want. Don't worry about getting it right. It's really to get a feel for answering those questions. Okay. We. Oh, yes. Um, someone speaks English or is admitting they do. Um, okay. Will there be a recording for this lecture? Hopefully. The lights are on. Okay, folks. That's the end of the hour. I will see you next week.